All right. So thanks to you all again for coming. Thanks to Mom for making the trip. Um, I want to thank the Land End Foundation for their support. All the staff at SAR for a wonderful summer, and especially Maria Spray, who probably takes care of about 500 things daily, great and small, for us. So thank you. Um, as was mentioned, I've been working on a book called Crooked Hallelujah this summer, and it's actually a collection of short stories um, it may end up being a novel in stories, sometimes it's called that. Sometimes people call it a, a linked collection, and, and that just means that it, is, it follows a family through the course of their lives. And um, the stories are also linked by, by place. They take place in eastern Oklahoma, in North Texas. Um, my main characters are four generations of Cherokee and mixed blood Cherokee women. And... It's primarily about Justine and her daughter, Rini, and they, they leave eastern Oklahoma and head to North Texas, which sounds similar since what I just told you. Um, but it, this takes place during the oil bust, oil bust in the 80s, primarily. And they're leaving in the midst of a lot of trouble. Um, Justine had Rini when she was quite young and had some volatile relationships in the meantime, and so, as a result, she marries a jockey from Texas, as you do. Um, <laughs> and so it's, you know, it, it's, this is really a book about family first and foremost. Um, Justine um, struggles to make a stable home and family for Rini, her daughter. She works hard to escape poverty and provide a better life. A life. And despite all that, Rini feels unmoored. She's leaving eastern Oklahoma and her great-grandmother, um, who is her anchor. Um, and her great-grandmother gets some stories. Her name is Annie Mae, and she may pop up depending on what we have time for tonight. Um, the book takes place over the course of about 50 years, give or take. Um, some themes, as I mentioned, family. Um, faith and religion play a really big role in a lot of the stories. Um, the family in Oklahoma belongs to a fundamentalist Christian church um, that at that time and in that place practiced faith healing and didn't believe in going to doctors. And so as a result, illness also plays a role, um, stays with the, the women and girls even when they leave the church and, and leave the, the home place. Um, and then cultural loss also comes up with leaving the family and leaving Oklahoma. Um, while I've been here, I finished, the, I, I finished my newest story, I think, is going to open the book, and that's really, really a relief for me. I've been working really hard to find the, the opening, figure out how to introduce the family and the church and the themes, and so that's been pretty, pretty exciting. Um, I've also gone through several revisions of, of a few stories since I've been here and put the book together in order. So hopefully we're getting really close and working on revisions of the, of the book as a whole now rather than simply stories. So it's pretty cool um, to have been here and gotten to focus on, on work solely. Um, that's not usually what I'm doing. I have a three-year-old who's, who's hanging, hanging tight so far. Um, but so it's, it's been so wonderful, and I'm just so thankful. Um, I'm going to start with reading um, a story called The Greater the Mass, the Stronger the Pool. It is um, it's in the first third of the book. It's not the very first story, um, but it takes place in 1991. Rini, the youngest of the family, is, is about 16 or 17 now, just to place you uh, where we're going to start and those are the main characters, although Justine's mom, Lula, is also in here. And Lula goes to a holiness church, um, the church I mentioned. As will soon be evident, Rini and Justine don't. Um, I have a, a little language warning. There's going to be some language popping up from time to time. Um, the other thing to mention maybe is I started the story in April. I've been working on it off and on since then, but then Prince died, and, and that wrecked me for a little while, and, and so eventually as I was working on the story, Prince worked his way in there, so, so we'll, we'll have a little, little Prince tonight. Okay, the greater the mass, the stronger the pool. 
and we're hearing from Rini's voice now. This story is an Oklahoma story. Um, 1991. We had to sneak to turn on the window unit Mom brought from my bedroom in Texas. Lula was so happy to see us. She followed Mom and I from room to room, worrying about the electric bill, worrying someone might trip over the cord, and our favorite, worrying we'd catch cold. It had to be 100 degrees in there. She insisted I wear a jacket because, because exposed skin was a sin, or led to sin. I was never exactly clear on the reasoning behind holiness doctrine. At any rate, Mom and I had hardly unpacked our room, and already Oklahoma July and Lula were pushing at our crazy. Aren't these nice, Lula said. She daubed sweat with a handkerchief and spread two ankle-length skirts onto the bed for Mom and I. We'll go to a motel, Mama, Mom said. It was a threat. We were not taking our earrings out either. A dare. <laughs> We'd come up to Lula's to stay a while, or to stay. We did that sometimes, leaving Texas, where Mom had married us off to, so many years back that us probably should have included my stepdad pitch, and landing back in Indian country when one of their fights got big enough to pack our bags. Lula pursed her lips and got after a fly with a rolled up magazine. I gave Mom a look, but she shrugged and passed a note to me that said, me and you plus Tin Keller Sunset tonight, using numbers for the 10 and two. Let's make a grocery list, Mama, she said, and motioned me out the door. When she came outside, waving her list and grinning, I was sitting in the driver's seat of her new used Mustang with the engine running. You must be crazy, too, she said, and jerked her thumb to the passenger seat. We ran by the truck stop for a six-pack of baby beers and a big red, and then we were flying through town with the T-tops off and the windows down. I pushed I do not want what I haven't gotten to the tape deck. But before Sinead, Sinead O'Connor, could finish the serenity prayer, Mom popped it out and put in 1999. We'd done a version of this the whole five-hour drive from Texas. I'd put in some of my music and feel for a minute like I wasn't in a car sagging with the weight of half our lives, headed to Lula's, where there was no TV, and the only records were Mahalia Jackson and Gospel Elvis. Mom gave everything a chance, but the Prince tape she had bought at our first fill-up always went back in. She'd go right to the little red Corvette, and seeing like that car was her shower and I wasn't sitting there, so sick of Prince I could puke. Her whole life she had wanted a Corvette, but she was married to Pitch, or used to be. Who could say? She had taken over payments on a Mustang just before we left. The thing looked and sounded like it had been run into the ground. But I think it had her thinking about possibilities again. The future, maybe. Please, can I drive when we get to the highway, I asked. I had my hips hovering over the seat, trying to zip the cutoffs I'd snuck out of Lewis. Mom whipped her head around and downshifted. Before I knew what was happening, we were mid-U-turn, pulling into the filler-up parking lot. I figured my whining had finally pissed her off. Rini, she killed the car, took a big breath, don't look, but there's your daddy. We bugged our eyes each other. Then we started laughing. My father wasn't a wound or even a scar, not a black hole or a dry desert. He just wasn't. Mom was my sun and my moon, though I never confused her for a perfect sphere. I was her all too, and that was us. Her equal parts beautiful optical illusion, and fiery hot star, and me, an imperfect planet she kept as close as she could. So when she said that day, don't look, but there's your daddy, it was Arsenio, not the nightly news. I got all tingly. I said, better late than never. Mom was still nervous laughing when she yanked the parking brake, but everything shifted in the evening swelter. A truck passed by with a one-two country bass pumping. Then the only sound was an occasional tapping coming from the tire shop across the street. I tried to smooth my hair, did my best to pull my shorts from my butt, wishing I was still wearing jeans. A drop of sweat ran down my stomach into my belly button as Mom and I found each other's hands across the parking lot. As soon as I saw him, I realized why I was nearly a foot shorter than Mom. He was a tiny man. He had on a white cowboy hat with a big turkey feather sticking out of, a, out of the band and a faded denim shirt with cut off sleeves, his shoulders and arms a deep reddish brown. Mom eased the jangly door open 
and we headed for an aisle with a clean view of the register. We stood there long enough for the lady at the counter to start eyeballing us for shoplifters, which seemed pretty close to the truth of the matter. Mom thumbed through Slim Jims. I was trying to decipher the ingredient list on a can of sour cream and onion Pringles. When the lady ran around the counter, counter and started for the door, Mom took off after her. I grabbed the Slim Jim she dropped and followed just in time to see that the man in the cowboy hat is now a man in a truck, pulling away. A red-headed kid about my age with britches tucked into stupid pointy-toed boots met the lady at the door. Thirteen on pump, too, ma'am. He said all breezy, like it wasn't 200 degrees outside, and my alleged father hadn't just scanned the fuck out before I could get a good look at him. Suspicious, the lady looked at a wad of ones, from the wad of ones to the kid's face. Feller told me if I paid for his gas, I could keep the change. In a hurry, I reckon. I was sure all he was going to do with this change was buy something he could huff into his blank brain. I couldn't get over how stupid he was in his narrow, pale face. That son of a bitch, Mom said. She pushed into the parking lot and shouted. At the sky, I guess, because the man was down the road. Fuck you! I shoved the Slim Jim into my shorts and went after her. You bastard, she shouted, which I only later understood to be irony. <laughs> Mom pushed the engine hard and shifted. She hit the speed limit quick once we were out on the highway then pulled a tiny Coors Light from the sack behind the seat. Told you not to look. She forced a grin and steadied the wheel with her knee and twisted the beer open. Shit, I'm, I'm sorry, Rainy. Doesn't matter, I said, turning toward the window. I never would have said anything, but how do you know it was us? The question was dumb. I had her thick, straight black hair before I permed the shit out of it on tiny rods, introducing my disco Diana Ross moment. Our eyes were the same, our noses, and don't even get me started about our teeth. Before she got me braces, she'd say, let me feel, and run her finger over my one slightly bucked tooth when she laid down to say goodnight. Then she'd feel hers and say, you're just like me, Rini. She'd hold me close and shake her head like our matching half-bucked teeth were the craziest things in the world. Her rough hands and jaggedy cuticles were time machines to my future. Factory grease lined her nails, all moons and ridges of pink chewed into perfect half circles. By the time she was 16, I was a baby in her lap. After she did the tooth thing, which I didn't even realize was weird until I hit middle school and thought everything was weird, she'd get, a, she'd get serious and look into my eyes and say, don't be like me, Rini. Don't ever be like me. Sunday morning, I woke up to the sound of a hammer and knew Lula was standing over Mom, wearing a handkerchief in her hand, pointing out broken stuff. That's what they did. Mom tried to force everything right with sweat and force of will, and Lula pointed out what didn't work and prayed. I'd been trying to stay out of their way more than usual since the daddy incident. The night before, I'd gone to Tulsa with my cousin. She was almost 20 and separated from her holy roller husband running wild in a way that only backslid holiness kids can. We'd smoked dope in a boarded up house some older guy my cousin was into said belonged to his aunt. Everything in the house was in place covered in a thick layer of dust. There was a saucer with a coffee ring but no cup on the table next to an open newspaper. One plate in the sink. Solidified milk and other god awful things filled the fridge which I didn't dare open a second time. The beds were unmade, but I had a feeling not exactly untouched. We sat on the far side of the paper in the saucer, out of respect or fear or something like both, burning candles for light. I tried to roll joints from the bag of leaf the guy had sold us. Nobody was getting high, but for a while we pretended. Maybe whoever lived here got raptured, I said, licking another pregnant banana joint. Don't, my cousin shot me a look. You'll get me paranoid. Her eyes were heavy with shimmering green eyeshadow and thick black mascara, making up for all the years makeup had been a sin. The truth was, I'd been paranoid. I couldn't get over the feeling we were all on the verge of something terrible, and somebody or something was watching it all happen. The guy took the flashlight to show my cousin the house. 
I worked up my nerve to open the stiff Tulsa world, straining my eyes over old news and obituaries, until I came to a review of The Outsiders. There was Tom Cruise from before Top Gun made all the boys in school want to be fighter pilots and decide that maybe it wasn't gay for dudes to play volleyball. Patrick Swayze before Dirty Dancing made him every girl's dream, and a scared-looking Ralph Macchio. I loved the book, but felt wrong that somehow they'd put movie star faces on those kids. Everywhere I looked, there was something else taking me completely by surprise. Like as soon as I figured out walking, someone threw me into an ocean and said, here, baby, learn how to swim. I put the paper back in place and wandered onto the dark porch. Tulsa was filled with noise, music from three different directions, people laughing, kids squealing, crotch rockets racing down narrow streets, what I hoped were fireworks in the distance. I gulped my beer and stayed in the shadows. When I tapped on the bedroom door and said mom was expecting me, I think my cousin was relieved. Mom once smelled a baby rattler that got inside Pitch's mom, mom's house with a closed door and a whole set of steps separating them. She was sitting on the porch, st porch steps when we pulled up, so I figured I was done for. I chewed hard on my gum and got indignant about Ralph Macchio lying in Johnny's hospital bed. The antenna to the cold cordless phone flashed and I knew it was pitch by the way mom was hunched over. They'd be a while. If I could just get in the door, I felt okay about my chances. Be to bed in a minute, sissy. She said she tried to smile. Have fun? She was bouncing her foot on a loose board that squeaked each time she let up. I nodded and kept going. Love you, she half turned toward the door and I thought she might want a hug. But Pitch said something that drew her back into herself. I showered and got to, into the football jersey I slept in, brushed my teeth and swallowed as much toothpaste as I could stomach. I pretended to be asleep when she came into the room we shared. She sat on the bed for a long time before she said, you better not be drunk. I waited her out. Listen, she said, pretty sure I can get my old job back. She wanted me to say something. We're going home Sunday afternoon, tomorrow I mean, back to Texas, okay? The first time we'd left, I'd written a goodbye note to my sixth grade teacher and made a big show of crying and hugging my best friend. When I showed up back in class two weeks later, I couldn't look at either one of them. This time, I barely brought any of my stuff. By the time I traipsed under the porch the next morning, the step was fixed. Mom was raking the red dirt, leaving dry grass hanging by the roots. She straightened her back and blew her, blew her nose with a bandana. Hey, sissy, you hungry? Would you like to take a ride to Tin Killer, Reenie Bean? Lula interrupted. I collapsed under the porch swing. I told you there's too much stuff to do here. Mom rolled her eyes at me, but then she softened. Maybe we can go later, Mama. Reenie could ride with me now, Lula said. Reenie's not riding with you anywhere. See, Lula's seizures had started right after Mom had me. Spells, we called them. They're the scariest thing I'd ever witnessed, but she wouldn't take anything for them. She believed she'd be he healed if it was the Lord's will. If not, well, prayers had worked at least well enough to get her license back. Mom and my aunts were mad as hell that she was driving again. If you want to kill yourself out there on those roads, so be it, but you're not about to take Rini. I picked dried hairspray, hairspray from my bangs, ignored them. When Lula got into her fear of God voice, I walked inside, picked up the phone, and called my cousin at her mom's house. She already had her mind on getting back to the Tulsa Creeper. I was pretty sure he had his mind on any piece of ass he could get. So I didn't feel bad when I said, can you come get me first? Something I want to do. When I got into her dented up Capri, my cousin pointed at the glove box where she had the bag of leaf. Not me, I said, and offered to light her one of the joints I'd rolled the night before. Uh-uh, she said. She sounded different from our phone conversation. Quieter. So what's up? Can we just ride around a little? I put the bag back in the glove box. I wasn't feeling so gung-ho either. Last night was weird, she said. What do you think happened in that house? Jason said they were just there one day and gone the next. He said his friend's mom didn't even know. She turned toward Tenkiller. Witness protection? 
Maybe it was aliens, I said. She didn't laugh, and I wasn't positive I was joking. Daddy always preached against the rapture, she said, trials and tribulations and all, but we're here together until the end, all of us. I could still hear my great uncle Thorpe's voice big and booming over all of us as he shouted scriptures, or even more scary, soft, when he cried and pleaded with somebody to get their soul right or risk eternal damnation. It was no wonder mom couldn't pray at all anymore. I wish he was still here, she said. He was bigger than life in spirit and body. Before he got sick, withered away, and died at home, he looked like some kind of Indian Superman with his black hair and square jaw. People used to ask him before they took vacations. Mom said they all went out and bought coffee makers after he decided caffeine was okay. You ever think about going back to church, I asked. All I do is try not to think about it. You don't think you're going to hell for cutting your hair and wearing jeans, do you? I knew from Mom that stuff could really mess you up. It's what the Bible says, and hello, adultery. You're a good person. I thought we agreed about the bullshit restrictions now that she had left church, even if in spirit she was still a believer. Was I a good person last night? I shrugged. She shook her head, kept driving. Maybe you're a good person with shitty judgment sometimes. Doesn't make you bad, just regular. She said, I cried all the way home. Then I woke up thinking about that skank all over again, like some kind of nasty skank addict. Mama came into my room after you called this morning, said she had a dream there was a cloud over me and she could see two angels and a devil fighting for my soul. She tried to get me to pray through. I didn't know what to say. She was crying and all this was getting to me. I didn't like thinking about a soul in terms of right or wrong, heaven or hell. I got so tired of the same thing every day, she said, washing Samuel's clothes, starching and ironing his pants stiff cooking breakfast, making lunch, cooking dinner, washing dishes, making love every night. Girl, I said, and we fell into a laughing fit. I'd gotten close two different times with different guys, neither of which bothered to pay me any mind afterward. We were three years apart, but it might as well have been 10. Because she had grown up in the church, though, there, was a way, there were ways I was the older one. Eventually, I didn't feel nothing at all, not even during altar call. I kept going up when I was called to sing until I just turned around and walked out the doors. I didn't feel right to pretend. She paused. Reed, thank you for coming to get me last night. I really did have to go home. She wiped away some tears. I don't want that pot. I don't even want it in here anymore unless you want to keep it. I couldn't take it home. Mom and her nose would be all over it from a mile away. Besides, despite trying to play it cool the night before, I'd never had weed of my own. I was scared to death. We pulled over at Snake Creek and walked out onto the dock and let it all go into the wind. Then we tore the baggie up into a thousand little pieces and let those fly too. Hey, I said, you know my father, like my real father, you mean Russell Gibson? Yeah, that's his name. I'd never talked to any of my Oklahoma family about him. Never asked, never told. Sort of, she said. Then she turned around and walked down the dock toward her car. What do you mean, sort of, I yelled, kicking a piece of plastic that had blown back onto the dock into the water. By the time I caught up, she was already starting the cry. I'm sorry, starting the car. So, I slammed the heavy door. It's a small town. Our tailpipe scraped the rock as we started up the hill. What do you know about him? Just hearsay, she said, and turned back toward town. And? Well, he put roof and nails on his neighbor's drive, and he cuts all of his neighbor's fences. The little deer say he poisoned their dogs. Shit. Sorry, Rainy. We saw him getting gas the other day, I said. He took off before I could get a good look. About right. But, like, I never did anything to him. Mom never asked him for a dime. You're better off, she said. You know where he works? I don't think he works. He might get a crazy check. Great, I said. If my outside was all mom, I was starting to wonder what my insides might be made of. 
We see him every time we go to the donut shop, she said. I mean, I do now. Let's go, I said. She shook her head, but I guess she was still used to doing what other people thought she said she ought to. This is what I knew about Russell, Russell Gibson before that day. Mom was 15. She said no. He was closer to 30 than 15. He waited down the road until she could sneak out that night. She didn't want to wear her long dress, so she had stashed a change of regular person clothes in the bushes. She said no. They pushed the car down the hill, coasted until they could start it away from Lula's earshot. She said no. He wore a white cowboy hat and drove a green Ford truck. His mom was Choctaw. She once brought over $50 and a Coke when I was a baby. When I asked my mom what it looked like, she said, I don't know, it was just a coat. Do Right Donuts was in a lopsided old house that needed painting, just three blocks from Lula's. And sure enough, the green Fords had cockeyed in the gravel lot. All that time, he'd been right there. You sure you want to go in there, my cousin said. I was already stepping out of the car. When we pushed in, the sweet, yeasty smell of donuts turned my stomach. I stopped in the doorway, and my cousin had to nudge me forward to get out the door. There he was at the back table, napkins wadded up around him, a newspaper in front of him. He was wearing the same cut-off shirt. I could see now that his black hair was buzzed close to his scalp. The cowboy hat sat on the table beside him. His nose was long and straight. He glanced in our direction, but didn't seem to recognize me this time. Or maybe I only imagined that he glanced at us. My cousin pulled me to the glass counter where a guy with a big white Frank Zappa mustache rested on his elbows next to a little kid who had his legs dangling down. Can I help you? A half dozen eclairs and a skim milk, please, my cousin said. On anything? You're getting six eclairs. Day olds are good heated up. I ain't been cooking. Just a big red, I said. We sat at a clean table. The little kid, as we sat at a clean table, the little kid came from behind the counter with a coloring book and a box of crayons. The Zappa guy followed him with a glazed donut on a paper plate and a carton of chocolate milk. The guy tucked a napkin into the boy's shirt and opened the milk. I do straw myself, the kid shouted, and the guy got, got excuse me, the guy guided the kid's little hand so he could tap the straw on the table and push it out of the paper without breaking it. Grammy will be back in a minute, the Zappa guy said. He glanced toward the back where Russell Gibson was huddled over the paper with an ink pen. Be good. He tussled the kid's hair and went behind the counter and started running water. My cousin pushed the box of eclairs at me, but I was shaking all over. I didn't know why I was there, what I expected to happen next. This all felt so stupid and pointless all of a sudden. And most of all, wrong. What did I care what this guy looked like or who he was? Let's go, I said, and stood up. She was shoving the rest of an eclair in her mouth and tucking the donut box closed when the little kid dropped a crayon. It rolled down the aisle, real slow, like we were in a movie, and the crayon rolling was the last thing to happen before the place got shot up. It stopped right in front of Russell Gibson. The little boy jumped down from his chair but pulled up when he saw where it landed. Russell Gibson leaned down for the crayon. He didn't smile or hand it to the kid. Instead, he set it there on his own table next to his paper. Then he saw me, or saw my mom and me, I guess, because he jumped up and took off out the door, leaving all of his stuff laying there. I wish I'd told him to give the crayon back, or gone over there and take it myself and told him what a piece of shit he was for keeping a kid's crayon and for running from the filler up and for being a sorry piece of shit probably every day of his life. I should have said all of that. I should have said, she was only 15. Instead, I stood there like a dumb statue while he brushed past me without a word. I was pretty sure I smelled his B.O. even after he was in his truck throwing gravel. The little kid ran down the aisle and grabbed his crayon. Then he looked at me and spun his head, his finger around his ear, saying, cuckoo, cuckoo, and giggling. I grabbed the hat and hooked my cousin's elbow, and together we took off out the door to her car. What now, she said. 
but I didn't answer. She started to drive, I guess so we didn't sit there like donut thieving maniacs. I didn't have any idea where we were going. No real sense that we were moving at all when we turned onto Lula Street. I didn't even realize we'd stopped in the middle of the road until my cousin squealed her tires and, looked, and pulled over. When I looked up, Mom's back was to us, huddled over Lula's front steps. By the time I grabbed my backpack and got out of the car, my cousin was already running through the yard. Lula was flat on the porch. Mom knelt over her, rocking back and forth and talking in a sweet voice like somebody who talked to babies might talk, might talk to a baby. Sure is a pretty day. Hear them birdies peeping, Mama? Mom was trying to hold one of Lula's hands, but they were still seized shut. It was like Mom had forgotten everything she knew about the seizures. My cousin made Mom let go. We used to keep wooden spoons all over the house for her mouth, Mom said. She looked wild-eyed at my cousin. Blood dripped from her hand to her lap. She pushed the flat of her hand in her be into her belly and her face broke in two. I didn't have a spoon. Mom took her by the wrist and held her hand into the air. Blood tendrilled down Mom's arm. My cousin put Mom's wrist in my hand and pressed a handkerchief she picked up off the porch to a gash in Lula's head. Put pressure on this, she said. I leaned over Lula, still holding Mom's wrist up with one hand. Lula was calming, starting to blow spit bubbles and make the sound she makes when she's coming back to us. One pink house shoe had fallen off. Her stockinged foot still twitched but was slowing down. I could see the stocking seam crooked <coughs> over her big toe. I wanted to fix it for her. My cousin palmed the top of Lula's head. She closed her eyes and started whispering, Dear Jesuses and thank you, Lords. Before long, my cousin's voice grew loud and forceful. Then she got quiet again and began to speak in tongues something that had always set me on edge. I didn't want to hear it. I focused on Lula's stocking and pressed the handkerchief as steady as I could. Mom hung her head and sobbed, helpless. After what felt like an eternity, but was probably only a minute or two, Lula opened her bewildered eyes and looked at each of us, searching, searching, searching. It's okay, Mama, Mom whispered. She smoothed her hair with her good hand. I handed Mom the handkerchief and straightened Lula's stocking along her toes. Then I scooted back and leaned against the house, wishing I could zap myself away from all of it. I thought about the rapture house again and wondered where the people went. I wondered if things were better for them. I hoped they'd won the lottery one morning and said to hell with all of you people and all of this shit. But I knew the chances were one in a million. Lula settled her eyes on my cousin and seemed to focus for a while. My cousin's voice slowed down, grew quieter until all I could hear were whispers and sniffles. Mom took Lula's arms and pulled her upright. Lula sat there a while, heavy gray braids falling across her breasts like ropes. Mom pressed ice to Lula's forehead and mouth. When she could stand, we helped Lula to her bed to lie down. My cousin's mom and a few other saints joined my cousin in prayer at the foot of the bed. Mom and I sat on the front steps. She'd pick at her bandage a little while, then chew on the side of her thumb. I hate leaving her like this, she said out of the blue. She already had us all packed up. Maybe we should stay. We should probably stay the night, I said. Maybe just stay. We can force her to go back to the clinic, Mom said. Again, damn sure can't make her do what they say. She seemed to be talking to herself. She put her face into her palms. What are we supposed to do? Be here when she falls? A lot of good eye by God did. She, she sort of yelled into her hands. Then she wiped her face and took a big breath and put an arm around me. We're a hell of a team. I can shove my hand down her throat and you can fix her pantyhose. Look, I said. The shadow of the house stretched into the road. The light had turned, making everything a richer, deeper color, giving things a sort of a purple glow, or maybe turning everything more the color it already was. In front of us, an orange moon was rising, huge and full. To hell with it, she said. Let's fly out to the lake before the sun goes down. 
She went inside to check on Lula, and when she came back out, she stopped short and seemed confused. I didn't realize why until I caught sight of the cowboy hat laying on the porch. I guess I'd had it in my hand when I ran up. I jumped over and fumbled it into my backpack, but of course it was too late. It's okay, you know, she said. It's okay. If you want to get to know him, it's okay. I guess I understand. I mean, my daddy's an asshole who wasn't ever around, but at least I've heard his voice. I ran into him today is all I said. And? Nothing, I said. It, it, he's an asshole. Yeah, she said, shaking her head. Or, or still an asshole. Mom handed me the keys and walked to the Mustang that wasn't ever going to be a Corvette. She didn't say one word about leaving myself an out or staying four car lengths behind. I stayed right at 55 until the speed limit slowed at Snake Creek. By the time we got out of the car, the sun was just a sliver above the hills over the lake. We had missed it. I took my backpack onto the dock anyway, and Mom followed. When I pulled the hat out and dropped it into the lake, she rolled her eyes. Don't do that for me. I'm fine. She leaned over, fished the hat out of the water, and tossed it into my lap. I flung it like a frisbee as far as I could, way beyond her reach now that it was heavy with water. He ran again, I said. That's why I had the hat. He took off so fast, he'd have left his ass if it wasn't stuck to him. <laughs> and? Fuck him, I said. Feed him fish heads, she finished. I got the better end of the deal, you know. Yeah, no shit, she said. Again, I was stating the obvious. No, I, I mean, I'm glad I don't know him at all. You had a person to miss when your dad left. I'm glad you never let him into our lives. All I've ever done is react and screw up, Rini. All you've ever done is take care of me. The hat was washing in and out, inching closer, uh, closer to us with each wave. Mom picked at her bandage. What do you want to do, Rini? What do you really want to do, go or stay? I guess I'd like to get someplace and stay there, I said. But where? I want to go home, I said. And it struck me that despite how I'd, I'd mourned leaving Oklahoma as a kid, Texas was my home now. I didn't want any more Tulsa rapture houses or speaking in tongues or, bad as it sounds, front porch seizures. I damn sure didn't want to run into Russell Gibson again. Pitch has been tore up since we left. He thinks of you as his own. Don't tell him about the whole Russell Gibson thing, okay? Don't worry. We sat there on the dock watching the waves pull in and push out, our legs dangling over Lake Tenkiller. The hat worked its way back to us, but sank just before it got close enough to grab and fling again. It's okay, Rini, Mom said as she stood to go. I can take almost anything. We left the next evening as the sun was rising again. I didn't try to play my music. I popped in 1999, a song about a future that people must have felt would never come, but was now upon us. Mom didn't sing along or dance this time. But before the song ended, she reached across the console and took my hand. By the time we got off at I-40 at Lake Eufaula, the moon was still big and golden as the sun. I knew it was only a reflection, but I watched it grow lighter and smaller all the way to Texas. Thank you. Well, I had some shorter backups, but I think that we are, are, are close. Um, thank you for hanging tight. That's a long story to read out loud, so thank you for hanging with me. Um, if you guys have some questions, we still have a little little time. No, nope, no pressure. Yes, sir. Uh, probably most of us are frustrated writers. <laughs> As, tell me, me too. Tell me, <laughs> tell me about practicing the craft. I mean, do you get up, go to the laptop, and sit there for eight hours, or do you go there when the mood strikes you? Sure. Or? Um, what are the mechanics? Yeah, that's a great question. I've been really, really blessed this summer to get up and go to the laptop for eight hours. Um, that's, that's what the summer at SAR has afforded me, and it's been amazing. 
Um, typically, though, um, we, we have a three-year-old, and since we've had her, I've, I've been home with her. So I, I was teaching. We had our kiddo, and since then I've been, been home with her and, and splitting that with writing time. So it's really in the spaces. Um, sometimes I get up very early in the morning. I'm definitely not a night person, so I'm not a person who can put the kid to bed and write, 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 write. I get up early in the morning and write during naps, and so it's just really when, when you can fit it in. And I think that sometimes, you know, maybe sometimes I would accomplish as much with that kind of practice um, as, if, then, as much as I would if I had a lot of time. Because, you know, it's easier to focus when you don't have any time. That's a, that's a really good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. I do. I'm kind of an obsessive person, and, and so I can't really let things go. And if something's not working, I, I, it's, I have a hard time turning my attention. I will stew over something and stew over it until I can figure it out or... No, I don't. I, I have a novel that I, I started, and when I sort of thought that I had finished this book, and then I started working with an agent and who, who um, hopefully showed me how much work I had to do. And, um, and so since then, the novel is just sitting there. It's like 50 pages, and I never thought I'd be interested in writing a novel. I was always a short story person, and then a novel seemed like it might be a relief to not have to create a new, almost a new world every time. Yes? Mm -hmm. but it's going to follow the family. So, right. in your view, how does a group of short stories with all the same characters over time, mm -hmm. how does that differ from a novel just being filled with chapters? Sure, that's a really good question. I think that um, in some ways maybe it doesn't. Sometimes it's just a matter of what, what you want to call it, or you know, if someone picks it up and wants to publish it, what they want to call it. But I think of... Um, for me, I think of each story as, as a work of art that I want to work on its own, if that were, even if that were the only story you were ever to read. Whereas a chapter, also, it's going to be a work of art, but it has more heavy lifting to do, because you have the benefit of everything that comes before and after. So, and, and also, in my case, I have a couple of stories that, they, I have a whole lot of stories about this family in eastern Oklahoma and North Texas, and sometimes I venture from the family entirely. Um, and it, so I think that, in my case, my book is going to be, it's really focused on the family, but sometimes as much as a book about a family, it's a book about place. So I have more leeway to follow my passions or inspirations, I think. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Did you bring any of your own life experiences for sure. I, I like to think that any time um, you see characters being strong or courageous or selfless, then that's pulled from my life, from the, <laughs> from, from the people that I know, the women who raised me, and it, the other stuff is just made up. <laughs> yes? Do you, when you're writing, do you always know where your story is going, or does it sort of sometimes write itself? No, I, I rarely know where a story's going. Sometimes midway through, I, I realize, like, ah, oh, that's the ending. That's the ending. I just have to get there. But starting out, it's typically, um, you know, something sort of just a feeling or an emotion, emotion you're chasing, trying to bring something to life and see what happens. And that's when the good stuff happens, once you hit on, hit on that, and then maybe you get surprised. Hi, you. When you write, do you picture an audience, or are you writing into a boy? Um, I don't think I, I picture an audience. I certainly have chirping birds on my shoulders who um, maybe I'm, I'm afraid of what they might think that I really want to live up to. I, I studied with Alan Chus and Dick Bausch at George Mason, and... Um, Alan and Dick were both wonderful mentors to me and, and did a lot to help me, but they also had different approaches. So I like to think of them as both angels on my shoulder. Um, but I, I don't really think I'm writing to an audience so much. 
I studied literary fiction. That's, that's what I practice in creative writing at, at Mason, but you know, I don't know that that's what I'm writing. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Um, did you find that your your ability or your focus as a writer um, changed after you had your daughter? And I don't mean time wise right. or just as a matter of maturity, but was that something that you noticed? I don't think so. I don't. I don't think so yet. Although certain stories that I've written, I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think that I know that yet. I feel like I'll know that later. But that's a really interesting question. I'd like to think about more. Yeah. Well, um, we can carry on this conversation. We can uh, party it like it's 1999. Great <laughs> 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 food is out in the hall. But please join me in thanking Kelly.